uh, ag, food and consumer branch within uh, the trade division of Austrade, and I'm also the head of the export supply chain services here at Austrade. I'll be your host for the virtual meeting today. And at the beginning, I'd like to uh, commence by acknowledging the traditional uh, custodians of the land from which myself and Michael Byrne are presenting today, uh, and that uh, we are in the lands of the, uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to other, any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people present on the call today. Uh, I also want to acknowledge at the top uh, the uh, board of the Export Supply Chain Services, which has been established to, uh, to provide governance for the work that we're doing and acknowledge the chair, Marg Stabe, uh, also present online today will be uh, Hermione Parsons, uh, Jay Meek, who is the General Manager for Trade within Austrade. Um, Chris Tinning is the fourth uh, board member. Chris is the um, uh, first assistant secretary at, at Department of Ag. Uh, um, forestry in, uh, uh, sorry, at DAF, and uh, in his stead we have Craig Hinder uh, online today, so just acknowledging those people. Um, today we have a one hour meeting, and uh, I will commence by just uh, giving a little bit of an outline of what the export supply chain services uh, are and, and what we provide. Then we'll be hearing from Michael Byrne, who is the principal for the Export Supply Chain Service, uh, and he'll update us on the latest in air and, and see supply chains and what we can expect to see heading into the peak summer season. Um, then we'll finish with an open discussion, and I really do uh, thank uh, so many uh, of you, and we have over 360 present today uh, who have sent through questions. We also have uh, a Slido session, so if you're uh, familiar with Slido, um, you can log on to slido.com. Uh, the hashtag is ESCS and we'll be uh, moderating those uh, questions and uh, we'll have hopefully plenty of time for, uh, for questions at the end. Um, so uh, you can remain anonymous or uh, by all means you may um, declare who you are in, in asking those questions. So moving right into it, the Export Supply Chain Services <coughs> Uh, a new initiative that has been set up by, uh, by the Australian government. The objective of the service uh, is uh, to, um, fundamentally, it's to provide uh, um, insights into the complex supply chain and logistics issues faced by our Australian exporters. We're focusing on uh, the small to medium enterprise uh, and of course, uh, ag, food and beverage exporters make up uh, such a large part of that uh, cohort. Um, we're also coordinating uh, the intelligence and insights from our government, uh, state and territory government partners, uh, as well as federal uh, government partners. Uh, and of course, uh, critical to supply chain are, are all the, uh, the logistics uh, and freight forwarding um, um, and as well as uh, airlines, et cetera, uh, with whom we're um, sharing insights and, and collating information. Unlike IFAM, um, the Export Supply Chain Services do not provide financial assistance to the, uh, to the exporters. Uh, it is all about uh, sharing information and better equipping the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Australian industry uh, and, and um, giving them better intelligence and, and understanding as to how to operate in the uh, much more complex uh, supply uh, chain scenario in which we're currently operating. So Austrade uh, has, throughout the trade division, uh, a number of uh, global engagement managers. We also partner with um, state-based trade start advisors throughout the country. And so we have over 100 people who on a day-by-day -day basis are in consultation with uh, with Australian exporters, uh, gaining insight and sharing insight back uh, back to to that network. Um, a, a major part of the work that we do is the advocacy. So coordinating and understanding this information and giving government, uh, both uh, uh, state and and federal, uh, an, an understanding of uh, of the complexities and uh, hopefully. Uh, we can uh, we can help them form policies that might help 
uh, alleviate some of the struggles. So the uh, the uh, the resources uh, that are available to industry are um, are threefold. Uh, we are um, providing um, su supply chain snapshots uh, every uh, fortnight. Uh, we've just published last Friday uh, the third of our uh, of our, uh, <coughs> our global supply chain uh, snapshot. Uh, and so this gives you um, the up-to-date information that we're observing from our discussions over the previous fortnight. We're also running virtual briefings such as this. Uh, and uh, this morning, uh, we had uh, a very uh, insightful uh, conversation with all of our state and territory uh, partners. Uh, and that information uh, just really helps to, uh, uh, to coordinate that, that information. Uh, the, that's enough about the background to the service. I, uh, I do point out that there is uh, 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 an email uh, that is monitored daily. Uh, if you have any information or if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to email us on that. But without any further ado, uh, I would just like to hand over and acknowledge the, the terrific work and, and how lucky we are in having Michael Byrne uh, join us. Uh, as the principal for Export Supply Chain Services. He's going to give us a rundown on uh, what he's seeing with, uh, with the state of uh, air and sea freight. Over to you, Michael. <coughs> Thanks, David, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope we're all well. So we'll start with air freight, and we'll talk about um, air freight a little bit. Um, and the latest numbers, so the, that was the week ending the 11th, but the latest numbers were 1,249 flights. They were up 2%. Flights to China decreased by 8%. Uh, we saw uh, increases in flights predominantly to Japan, Singapore, Thailand, and, and a negative uh, number to the US. Um, a Sydney airport was still very dominant at around 43%. Prior to COVID, it was 38%. It was as high as 68%. So there is some spreading back to normal. Um, we're at about 60% of pre-COVID numbers. People are, have been saying that it was going to go up a lot again after when school holidays started in Victoria and Sydney. That has not been the case. And, and again, we never said it would be. Um, there's lots of structural reasons why it can't be uh, big increases. And, and we're seeing a point or two go up each week. And that's about all that can technically happen because there are so many uh, inputs that are going in. If, if you read a couple of interesting things, even from the weekend, Israel has now banned four engine aircraft from its airspace apart from the military to reduce emissions. There's a capping now on uh, air, aircraft numbers at, uh, at Shipole Airport to reduce emissions. So we're seeing that. We're seeing a real shortage of pilots around the world. Um, you read the Delta report uh, or annual report, they're not going to get back to their pilot numbers to 2025. Um, the big Western... Uh, countries rely commercially. A lot of them rely on po military pilots being turned out. The US is not turning out military pilots. They're paying $50,000 bonuses to keep them in the military, particularly fighter pilots. You can read into that what you will. Um, we're seeing airlines say that they will keep retiring old fuel, uh, old gas guzzlers, because they can't afford them. Don't forget to fill your own car up before the end of this month when fuel goes back up 22 cents a litre as our minimum before a declining Australian dollar. You're seeing uh, Nord, Nord, Nord Stream 2 uh, being restricted in its supply. You're seeing Venezuela and Russia did not allow OPEC to increase production, which was the request from the West. So fuel prices must remain high that means airlines aren't going to run old gas guzzlers. So you've got a shortage of pilots. You've got people looking at emissions. You've got a shortage of energy input, and energy always goes up northern winter. 
And this northern winter in the northern hemisphere, we have low, very low stocks. You have OPEC and you have a whole lot of issues. And that means, A, prices won't come down because there isn't going to be a large influx of planes. You don't have enough pilots, you don't have enough planes, and people want to retire old gas guzzlers, and fuel prices are too high, so they need to reduce their costs. We're then seeing very, very, very heavy um, yields and passenger numbers on some sectors. So uh, there's two, two airlines who we're speaking to constantly, uh, where they're at 98 or 99 percent capacity capacity on passengers. I'm going to London on the weekend for Australian Super. As some of you know, uh, I am on Sydney Airport, New South Wales ports, and Pearl ports in the UK. And David will talk about one of those things after I finish. Um, if I look at the price, I'm I'm not paying the price that that ticket costs now to what it costs. Only in February, it's six thousand dollars more, and at ninety-eight percent capacity going to Europe on two of those three airlines, um, there's about a ton and a half left for freight. So at ninety-eight percent capacity on passengers, a full crew, basically a full plane, all the all the bags with that, a few spare parts and mail, there's about a ton and a half left. So we were getting 44 tonne equivalent cube and tonne before passengers. So on that basis, you need 35 extra planes to do what we were doing when there were no passengers prior to February. And that's just not the case. It hasn't gone up by 35 times. So that is why we're seeing really high prices. We were speaking to the Western Australians this morning. They were talking about their averages well over four. We were talking to the Victorians and New South Welshmen. Their average is at three. I just don't see that coming down. Why would it? And not only all of that, then, elasticity. Airlines have worked out that there's more elasticity in freight. That people did pay it for two and a half years, as high as 13 times, and down through that trajectory, down to that five, six times five, four, three, two, nothing ever got under two except for Qatar. There was no price ever under two, even in the spot. So surging travel demand is also putting extra capacity uh, constraints on. Yes, Qatar has said they're going back to Perth. Yes, it's great that United said they'll start flying from Melbourne in November and the daily in December. Yes, there are A and A and JAL are saying they're going to start flying more flights. <coughs> um, but overall, plane numbers are only going up one or two points a month. Um, maybe three points a month. So it's a long way to get back another thousand planes at three points a month. Um, and then obviously the, the Western world with very low un, unemployment here at 3.65 and 66.6% participation rate. We haven't seen unemployment numbers like that and participation rates for 48 years. The airport model is suffering. There's 5,000. I was at Sydney Airport, a board meeting. Yes, there's 5,000 jobs that aren't filled in, the, in that um, precinct. And the models are probably going to have to change. If you look at the core economic data, which people who are deep into logistics and supply chain, like I spend a lot of time looking also at that economic data, um, what, why would anyone go and be a cleaner, a security uh, operator, a bus driver on some of those things at an airport when they're on, a lot of them are on base pay minimum wage and on contract for one, two or three years. If you're on a one year contract, you can't get a, a rental property in Sydney. So why would you do that? Um, that's why there's 5,000 empty jobs. And while, while there's that many empty jobs, airports will be slow and difficult uh, with such slow unemployment. Um, so there were some real things in the air freight and aviation market, and that is reflected in all the big Western uh, airports 
uh, with congestion or difficulty. It's not only fuel costs. It's not only lack of pilots. It's not only retiring planes and slow production, particularly the 787s, but it's also a lack of workers on, as in all ground handling positions. Um, and I don't see that that will improve much over time. Moving on to sea freight, um, I think the big things in sea freight, just one more thing on air freight, uh, look at Donata last week in Sydney, I think it was, and Melbourne, they signed an increase for 17.2% over two years, back pay to 2020, and they'll dress it up, it was only 4.8%. But if you add back the back pay, it's 17.2%, and then they can still go for another 4.6% in June next year. So those wages are going up into the 20s. Sea freight, I think the, the really big thing, and yes, we are seeing sea freight prices come down the last month or so, around 8%. Um, if we go to the sea freight side, it's been about 8%. Um, but then Western Australia to Asia, uh, Southeast Asia ports, it went up 3.4%. He had the latest numbers that I didn't even have this morning. Overall, it's gone up about, down about 8%. But if it's gone up 500% since pre-COVID, 8% on the 500% is nothing. Average delays... Um, Still sitting at 6.28 days or reducing delays, crucial for shipping lines. We ha we've had some big discussions with shipping lines. Um, they are, have been saying, and one shipping line said that uh, they are still happy and want to do blank sailings and black sailings, depending on how you want to describe it, of their 52 scheduled services on one sector out of Australia this year. Only 43 are on time and they blanked the others because they were getting off their schedule. They couldn't afford to miss one, two, three days in each of Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. And then they were out of their 46 day schedule for that route or whatever it was. And so it was better to cancel it. US poor conditions are worsening, uh, 12 to 24 days. Savannah's now up 10 to 15. Major ports in Europe, heavily congested. <coughs> and the big thing there is heavy, heavy industrial action. So we've seen the Germans, Bremen, and those ports resolve those issues at about 9% increases. Um, and I declare again, which I did before, that I am on the border pill ports, the eight ports in the UK and Ireland, uh, the, either the biggest or the second biggest operator. We went on strike for 12 days starting last night. Felix Dale is back at work, the largest EU port, uh, owned by Hutch, has just come back from strike. They've been on strike for eight days. Uh, RPL inflation is running at 12.3% in the UK. Most of the operators in the UK have offered around 8 to 10%. Um, Unite have knocked that back and said they want 12.3% plus, 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 which is probably 20%. So... <coughs> <coughs> they're really big numbers. The US, there's about 24,000 people on the West Coast in rail and uh, intermodal and sea freight um, and sea operations. They've just been offered 24% over two years and knocked it back, 14% in the first year and 10% in the second. 24%, they're big numbers. Um, so... We're seeing large industrial issues. We've just gone through them in Germany. We're deep into them in the UK. I think they'll start in the US probably around uh, Thanksgiving, maybe a little bit before then, which will really impact uh, global supply chains if they go ahead. And companies, if they're giving those sort of increases, they have to flow through to customers. And they have to flow through uh, to farmers and producers in the end because people can't afford to absorb those sort of increases. While the global container fleet is 12% larger than 2019, highlighting the effect of congestion and reliability on the ocean supply chain means there's very little uh, additional capacity. Schedule has improved to 40.5%, but this month I expect it to go backwards. 
uh, because of we'll be coming out of the German and now we're deep into UK ports. And Felix Stowe has already announced, if you look it up, that there will be another eight days of strikes after they get through the strikes appeal and particularly Liverpool. Um, so I expect uh, reliability to go down. Um, and reliability will definitely go down if the US has a major industrial action. Um, pricing, it's hard hard to tell. I don't see it actually coming down much and it's not going back um, to pre-COVID. Um, there's heavy congestion, industrial action, and then we have to think about what those flows through of Germany, the UK and the USA will mean for our industrial instruments uh, when they come up next year and the year after in our major stevedoring operations. There will be some flow through. The, the, the US longshoremen won't be getting 24% and people here will be only accepting threes or fours when our inflation is between six and eight. So I think it's a tough time here. Um, the shipping companies, we've had some big discussions with them recently. They're also... Uh, very focused on profitability and getting an, an acceptable level, level of return after the, the dire returns between 2009 and 2019. But they're also very, very uh, interested in the continual imbalance of 40 foot versus 20 foot and 20 foot um, food grade containers and how Australia in their view, some of them would say, has to move to 40 footers because that motor will reduce the overall cost impost in their business. And time may be up in the medium term on uh, different container types. And as they say, why would I put a, a 20 footer or 40 footer food container here and get five, six, seven grand out of it out of Western Australia, where I can put it on the West coast of the USA and get 20. It's just straight economic. So there's lots of things in change here <coughs> that are going on. I think there's probably more unpredictability in sea freight and then sea freight will be impacted by energy costs. If the same applies, if you're going to have a tightening of energy costs with the Northern Hemisphere winter and very low fuel stocks globally, that has to throw, flow through to sea freight as well. So, but I think this is probably a bit more unpredictable and not as transparent in the movement of issues compared to air freight. And David, in the interest of questions and everything else, I will stop there. I think we have one more slider that... Uh, Outlook, that I might have already done it. Um, so industrial action, very tough. IMO rules, we know that 50 to 75% of the global fleet will need to re introduce slow steaming. Um, sailing time by 10 to 20% for every journey. We also know there's 5.6 million, or I don't know the latest number of new TU coming, but that is not all going to be new TU because half of that will replace ships that no longer comply with IMO 2020 and so old, they'll be beached. Northern winter schedules, um, you'll know more about that than me. Um, most destinations are expected to recover to around 60% of pre-COVID level. And, and that is all we can see. When we've gone back and checked the and, and put a slide rule over the Northern Hemisphere winter flying schedule, we get back to 60%, 63%. We're at 60. So it's not going to improve that much. Uh, there'll be a few ad hocs here. And then a lot of the floor, extra flying in December and January will be to holiday destinations with like Bali and Vanuatu, Tahiti. That will not improve the overall freight position except for the fractionalisation of cost in ground handling. And I'll stop there, David. Mm, very good. Um, some, uh, some sobering um, observations there, uh... There, yeah, Michael, um, you know, there's more flights. In summary, there are more flights, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, equate to better availability for freight. Uh, and we, we need to be mindful of, and I guess this is a, an overarching message to all the exporters out there, uh, eyes wide open, sober decisions made as you're negotiating your contracts for supply. 
and watching yeah. fuel, watching fuel, and and in all your transport contracts, even land based, because uh, fuel has to go up at least twenty two cents a litre again at the end of this month. And 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 there's a handy hint. Don't forget to, to uh, fill, fill up, up your, your own, own car. Tank. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, just a reminder, uh, you can see on the screen there, um, slido.com uh, is the forum by which uh, you are free to ask questions. Uh, hashtag ESCS is, is the tag. Um, and I also just uh, want to thank uh, Michael for acknowledging uh, any uh, possible conflicts of interest. And I just want to draw, out, draw to your attention. We've had a lot of questions already. Uh, a couple of them actually... Uh, talk about um, New South Wales ports, and I just wanted to make a, a declaration up front. Uh, as uh, Michael has declared uh, that he is on the board of NSW Ports. Um, for those of you who watch are watching um, the media, uh, it has been reported as a federal court case and ICAC investigation uh, into the operations of the Newcastle port. Um, there's currently a, a federal court appeal against an original decision that has been made. Uh, therefore, in this forum and because of uh, of, uh, of Michael's conflicts, we uh, we cannot uh, uh, make any comment or reply to any questions regarding New South Wales um, ports. Um, so we'll, we'll be skipping over those questions. I uh, also should just point out to everybody that we are recording this session. There's some terrific insights there from uh, from uh, from Michael, and and so we will be making this available for people to be able to review. Uh, at a later stage, but um, whilst we're waiting for questions to come through on Slido, and you'll, you'll start to see those, uh, and if you're not familiar with Slido, if you like uh, somebody's question or comment there, if you uh, click on the on, on the thumbs up, uh, <coughs> that, uh, that gives you uh, an opportunity to register your interest, and it, it flags attention for me to be able to, uh, uh, to prioritise that. Um, I want to, so as I mentioned, uh, we've got a lot of people on online, a lot of people um, registered questions, and, and one question that has come through prior to, uh, or as part of the registration process, is uh, while China still accounts for a large percentage of our exports, um, will there be greater focus placed on India, Indonesia, Thailand and the Philippines to help uh, diversify exporter, uh, exporters' footprints? and? Uh, maybe I can uh, I'll, I'll answer that, but also acknowledge that uh, that Jay Meek, our general manager, is on online and perhaps visible on screen as well. But but certainly uh, over the last several years, Australia has been very focused on uh, diversification, uh, and uh, that's in response to geopolitical issues. But it's also just sound business strategy, which we uh, at Australia always advocate uh, that you need to have a balanced. Uh, portfolio of export uh, markets, you know, hedge your risk is is a is a is a point of um, um, advice that we always like to give. So, um, whenever you're talking to our global engagement managers, we will always work with you as an exporter to help you work out which is the best market or the best portfolio of markets into which you should be uh, focusing. And certainly. Uh, we, with the current uh, government, we have a very clear focus on India as a priority market, as Indonesia uh, as our nearest market, in, and uh, and all through the Pacific as well. You will have seen and observed uh, uh, that um, uh, pivot, perhaps, to, to that uh, kind of focus. But we do acknowledge that China is still a major export market uh, for us and, and a clear a partner, and of course, we continue to help uh, companies on a day-to-day -day basis into into uh, into China and and to all of our markets. Um, we have ramped up our footprint offshore uh, throughout each of the regions, including uh, North America and Western Europe as well, so that we've got more boots on the ground to be able to help you connect with potential uh, partners in the market. So, uh, if you are uh, not already engaged with Austrade, let me encourage you to reach out. 132878 is our hotline number um, and, uh, and we can uh, assign a key account manager to help you uh, with your own diversification plans. Um, going on to the next uh, question, um, recent news indicates soft demand uh, with reductions in shipping rates. Uh, you've covered some of this, but... Uh, yeah, I might make a, a yeah. couple of comments and wrap up a couple of questions. I think um, 
Speaking to the shipping companies, they are still extremely busy, particularly um, with cotton. Uh, they're seeing large increases in cotton, large increases in grain and bagged grain as well to try to get more out of the country. Um, the shipping companies ha have been saying that demand has changed a little bit. There is a bit of a softening on import, but they don't think that'll last long because of coming to uh, Christmas stocking, although that should have been nearly done by now. Um, so demand, they're, they're still very comfortable and exports have been extremely strong. Exports have been extremely strong. Yes, pricing's come off a little bit. No one's talking about it coming off very much. Um, and, and they've worked out there's more elasticity. The Australian dollar, I think, has been coming down of late, which will then, as you know, most things are done in USD. Um, no one... I know there's a question that's in here two or three times. When is it going to revert to normal? Well, I'd suggest to you this is the normal. If at least for a while. This has been the normal now for two years. In fact, prices have come down in air freight dramatically from where they were two years ago, uh, but they are above prior. I'd, I'd, if you go back and do the fractionalisation of cost, they should never have been at 50 cents a kilo anyway because it was far too marginally costed. 30 cents a kilo, 40 cents a kilo, 50 cents a kilo. Um, also, did we really think that Eight hundred to a thousand dollars a box would stay forever. Was very import driven. I see we we had a big chat with the Western Australians today, and I saw Terry last week as well. They're paying seven and a half thousand dollars a box. Um, so while it's unpalatable and hurting, this is around the the normal. I think. Hmm. Jay, you look like you're pushing a button. I was going to add a couple of comments and tie them together, actually. Uh, David's comment is that um, I think it's also important people realise that we're not necessarily unique in all of this, that we are only 2% of seed freight as an, an example, but other countries are going through their own similar journey around this space. Um, the second thing probably to highlight is that if we were just to focus on uh, one industry sector, and I'll call that agri-food for a, a broad name at the moment, is that it's not even. There are some commodities that we see moving, like our barley um, being produced and going into new markets on what's happened with our um, exports to China, and others that are actually increasing, uh, that are finding incredibly difficult, increasingly hard, and wine's a prime example of that. And that's compounded by what we're seeing happen in the freight space as well. I just want to put those couple of comments on the table. Yeah, thanks very much, Jay. Um, I have a, another uh, question here talking about the lower uh, AU dollar um, value and, and, and the reducing uh, prices as well. Uh, we've had bumper crops uh, over the last few years and um, our, our colleagues at DAF point out that our, our, the quality of our product is, uh, is increasingly uh, more sought by... Uh, by our export market destinations, in, you know, in, in, in view of the volatility of um, exposure uh, to disruptions, for example, with the, the war in Ukraine. So there's greater uh, demand for our products, but um, does Australia have the infrastructure to keep up and, and also acknowledge uh, <coughs> Kevin Norman, one of our global engagement managers uh, in, in Queensland, has also asked a similar question. There have been new ships built to offset some of the older ones scrapped. Um, so there's, there's infrastructure issues here. Uh, you talked earlier, Michael, also about the fact that the Israelis are uh, not allowing four, uh, four engine jets to reduce uh, emissions. Uh, carbon emissions. So all kinds of infrastructure uh, complications coming here. Does Australia have the infrastructure, do you think, to be able to, to, be able to uh, well, cope with the demand? So this is an opinion. This is a, an opinion. It's just an opinion. This we is just an, your opinion, Michael. Yeah, this is... Um, look, I think both Labor and Liberal governments have done a fantastic piece of work on Ag 2030. 
I think an amazing piece of bipartisanship and thinking, and they should be both congratulated for that. And and I'd say, going from whatever the number is, seventy two billion US dollars to a hundred billion by twenty thirty in today's value, which is an enormous amount of tons. Once you get rid of the, you scrub the dollars and you you know, you have a common benchmark. Or my own view is that. Our producers can produce it, and it's unbelievably high quality. My view is that Austrade and the Department of Trade and people will sell it because it's in such demand. I just can't make the numbers work getting across the ports. <laughs> how how do you get another twenty eight billion? And maybe you can. I did maths, but maybe I did it badly. <laughs> I just can't get the tons across the port because our ports just don't have enough integrated connected rail activity to move that sort of tonnage. So well, I think the infrastructure from council states and federal government all need to be looked at. It's a, it's a really complex issue. I, I'm in Sydney. I drive along Foreshore Drive. Uh, sorry, I drive along Grand Parade under the, the first tunnel of Sydney Airport. And on a Monday morning at 7 o'clock, to turn right onto Foreshore Drive, the trucks are lined up for three kilometres. Mm-hmm. Now, that only goes 3.2 million to you. It's supposed to get to seven. How do you get another four million to you, to you out of it if you've already got three kilometre truck years? Because mm-hmm. you can't do it all by truck. So the infrastructure over time needs to change. Mm. Interesting. Thank you for that. Um, <coughs> CB asks uh, on Slido, how do you see the IMO 2020 emissions commitment impacting vessels deployed to Australian routes uh, and assume that newer high productivity vessels will be deployed to higher profitable um, uh, routes? Exactly. So <laughs> yeah, right. I think the person's answered their own question. I think that's entirely right. Or with places with harder emissions, particularly Europe. Mm. So Europe, Europe leads the way on tougher emission stances all the time. Mm. The EU, so those ships will go to the EU predominantly, and then we're in that we're in that category, aren't we? Where the majority of our TU ships are between about four and seven thousand TU, because we're a real we're not a we're not a a bottom feeder market. As in, I don't mean bottom feeders. A, a feeder ship is in that lower category. We're not never going to be in the twenty two to twenty five thousand category T U. Maybe one day we'll get to fourteen thousand T U ships, but we only have one berth in the country that can take a fourteen thousand T U ship, which is one berth, not the port, at Port uh, Port of Sydney. And yes, you can argue they can do it in Port of Melbourne, but not at the draft level and depending on the tide. And there'll be no dredging of Port Phillip Bay if people remember what happened last time when they went to dredge it. So those newer ships aren't going to come here, in my view, because they're going to go to the EU where they're bigger, where they have more emission uh, obligations and they can make more profit on them. Mm, Okay. (coughs) We have a a couple of questions here. I I did cover it in my earlier um, observations about uh, about um, the what is uh, what what we are providing from the export supply chain services, and just uh, uh, to draw to your attention that um, whilst there's um, we're, we're building on the information gathering and intelligence and insights sharing element of the IFAM um, arrangements. Um, a question here regard, asks, uh, or uh, quite a number of questions ask whether there'll be freight assistance in the future, such as we had with IFAM. And, and to answer that, that was, uh, you know, a once in a maybe a hundred years uh, uh, response to, uh, well, it was a response to a one in a one hundred years emergency, perhaps. And, and there's no possible way that uh, we would be able to go back to that kind of scenario. Well, when when it was put in, it was. Air freight, and Jay was here, I was here, air freight prices were 13.6 times and there was 300 planes. And really, only Sydney Airport and maybe Melbourne had some planes. So it was desperate times. They ha- it had to be done. I think the federal government did an amazing job, Austrade and DFAT, then trying to work through the problems there. It had to stop. A, you can't afford to do it. 
be WTO implications. You want you want global trade. You've got to be in global trade, and technically and legally, it couldn't go on forever. And I was convinced of that as well. And lots of people educated me. I, I was fully supportive of what the federal government did. We, we've got a. This is the new norm. Some of these prices, they're not going back. They're going to be two or three or four times, and we have to work that out. So I don't think the federal government should kick in, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And, and Mike, I maybe add a little bit more to that, is that you know, Australia plays from a rules-based approach to trade, and the, the last thing that you want to do is actually jeopardise our exports more broadly by continuing something that might deem to be or not. IFAM was always a short-term measure, and so it did have to end, and we wouldn't want to expose the nation to the WTO by continuing to do something that might um, uh, affect that. Yeah, and I think also, Jay, the federal government originally wanted it to go to three months, for three months. Um, and then the federal government and departments realised how tough it was and good, bad or indifferently, people like me have been here two and a half years out of retirement and Austrade is still putting people into supply chain to try to help people. But originally it was a three-month commitment. So... I would suggest to you the federal government, both sides of the the ledger, has still been very committed to try to help people here. Mm. Agreed. Mm. Very good. Um, I'll, I'll go to a follow-up question that's come in on Slido and remind everybody that uh, you can ask questions. Slido, <coughs> Slido.com, the hashtag ESCS, um, is, is, the, is the platform by, where, by which you can ask questions. But just following on... Uh, CB asks, and and um, uh, do you see the impact being that Australian freight will become much slower due to a lack of availability to high, high, um, higher productivity vessels, and the need for slow steaming, and and what other impacts um, will this have? Do you foresee? Oh, well, slow steaming just by its nature, if it takes longer to transit that uh, kilometres, it's going to be slower, um, which will be a problem for people. And we get, we, get, we get issues and have had a lot of complaints, particularly about the Middle East, how duly end date, um, what I, very old-fashioned because I'm old, what's duly end date, which is your date of expiry on your maximum 90 days, that to the Middle East you're losing five or six extra days of sh uh, potentially of shipping. And some purchasers won't buy that because they've lost six days out of their 90 or whatever. Um, so it will be a concern for people and they'll need to look at that. Mm. Um, is that being less efficient? Well, it's complying with a, a global edict in regard to emissions. Mm. Uh, I don't know about efficiency. You have There's been another agenda set. Mm. Um, the world has set a, a pathway on emissions I'm not a scientist. I'll accept what the scientists say. Um, but that will slow down the impact Julian date on food particularly. Mm. David, can I, can I also add that, you know, one of the common pieces of intelligence we get for business, which is quite well known, the longer the shipping time frame, the longer the cash flow cycle. So, Frank, there was, there's ultimately a, a financial hit to a business in terms of it's committing its goods and it won't get paid until the goods get there, typically. And so that's actually impacting as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this goes to the earlier point that I made that, uh, you know, I think people need to go, uh, go into negotiations with, the, with their customers overseas, you know, with, with clear-eyed, uh, sober evaluation of these costs. Uh, build strong relationships <coughs> just um, with your partner overseas yeah just something interesting it's just popped up on my um, computer in the Australian Sydney airports just decided to run another jobs fair they've filled two and a half thousand positions since the last job fair but they still four thousand people short to run the airport efficiently mm. it's just it's just come out now. I knew it was coming out because I was at a board meeting yesterday, but I didn't realise there's still 4,000 people short. So that shows you again 
in a low employment model, uh, low unemployment model in Australia, how hard some of these architectural infrastructure assets are doing. Mm. It's just out in the Australian right now under Sydney Airport, if you'd like to read it. Mm. And, 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 and people looking for forklift drivers to be able to pack the container that they get hold Good of. Good luck. <laughs> Understood. We're, we're not trying to paint a deliberately <laughs> uh, um, miserable picture here, but we do, you know, going back to my point, I just, just want to point out that you do need to be very uh, um, uh, patient in building your relationships with your, with your customers on the other side. Yep. Be open and transparent about the cost. They're having the same cost impacts as well. Um, so when you're setting prices and, and, and committing to contracts, bear all of those factors as... As Jay said, the costs associated with uh, protracted inventory uh, all need to be uh, all need to be remembered. Uh, a question here about uh, fertiliser imports: Can we offer any hope in terms of prices and availability, given the lack of de- support for domestic production? Oh, I'm I'm not an expert expert in fertiliser um, or that importation. Um, I, I do hear it's incredibly difficult, but I, I'm not knowledgeable enough to make a comment. Mm. Fair enough. Um, are there any lessons to be learned from how other export uh, nations uh, have, have managed the current situation? And uh, Jay, you might want to jump in here as well. Yeah, so I don't think just like uh, we talk with um, obviously quite a few countries around the world about how they're reacting. And um, I can certainly say that the you know IFAM was something the rest of the world looked at. Um, very close to see what we were doing about being innovative in that space. And equally, we've uh, had a number of countries reach out to us about the export supply chain service, this type of information. So I think um, all countries are looking at things to adapt. And we know that New Zealand had similar mechanisms in place to help support that. And there were certainly uh, similar processes to what we're doing with helping businesses um, diversify markets, and that's creating demand by doing promotion, uh, connecting to people, giving market information and connecting to customers, but having this type of information to be really informed when actually concluding contracts so that it can move forward. Michael, yeah, I think, that, I, think, I think that's exactly right. What, what uh, Austray, to their credit, are trying to do is give people freight forwarders, producers associate even more and more information uh, to help them in their contract negotiations where if they cannot set uh, fixed fuel prices not to think about what's going to happen after the northern hemisphere north stream too to keep keep things at front of mind that usually in the day-to-day of action in the our tactical businesses that we don't think about enough that Everyone's so busy and so focused that they don't they don't get these big pieces of information that the UK has 12 days of rolling strikes, that people want 12% increases that in, in supply chains, that Donata, like we picked that up out of uh, an industrial instrument that signed 17.3%. What we're, we're trying to do is a lot of people who are running their businesses could never get all that information or sieve it or know it. So it doesn't give the picture. And and we're trying to give you a picture uh, of what's happening so that you can prepare your commercial negotiations as best you can, as best you can. And Mark, maybe we could have one more. Is it like the observation for an organisation that meets with thousands of businesses, we're seeing people make decisions based on this intelligence and that might be changing modes of transport, um, where possible, doing things with their product, structural adjustments. So there's a sequence of things that we're watching. And equally, I just want to be really clear, we're here to listen. And that's why we're wanting to ask the things that you're facing so that we can help form uh, a view and shape policy here with the Australian government, as David mentioned earlier. Yeah, and hopefully, if you write to us, we're, we're doing a newsletter I know there's 370 people plus or whatever it is on this call, which is a huge number. So um, obviously people are very interested if you're getting 370 people on a call. Uh, We are doing a newsletter every second week on a Friday. On one week it might be on sea freight, the next week it'll be on air freight, the next week it might be on 
fuel costs, uh, whatever it is. So hopefully you've registered for that and, and we'll send you that information. It's only two pages. It's very punchy uh, with what we're seeing around the world. So maybe register for that and that might help you as well. You can, uh, of course, go onto our Austrade website uh, and, and look for the for that snapshot on our website. Um, I, I mentioned the 13287 number, which uh, you can always use to get onto Austrade folk and, and also draw to your attention an email address, supplychains at austrade.gov.au, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, monitored daily and, and we can respond to you. And of course, uh, hopefully you're also engaging with, uh, for many of you, you'll be engaging with <coughs> with our global engagement managers or with the Trade Start advisor partners uh, throughout the country. Um, we're, we're getting close to the end. I just want to skip through the last few questions here that are on Slido and just acknowledge that uh, Austrade, the first question here regarding uh, meat uh, and, and MLA, uh, we do partner with all of the peak uh, industry bodies, including MLA. Uh, and offshore, we, we have very strong partnerships for promotion of Australian um, uh, produce and for Australian, uh, 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 you know, manufactured food products and, and, and beverages. Um, and, and there is very strong demand. So we are continuing to, uh, to proselytise the benefits of buying from Australia throughout the globe. Uh, but as, as, as Michael said uh, uh, earlier, the airlines are also recovering from COVID. They also have major losses that they need to recoup. They will be looking to maximise their return on investment. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that uh, they can get more money from putting bodies on planes than, than, than things in the hold. So, you know, this is the new norm and this is our reality. So, uh, so um, you know, we just need to, to work within that uh, framework. Uh, the uh, Are there are going to be adjustments to the rates of assistance for the Tasmanian freight equalisation system uh, scheme. And I uh, just do want to acknowledge the great partnership we have with every one of the states and territories. Uh, if you're in those states, contact your, <coughs> uh, your, your local people in those states because there are a number of mechanisms available. I won't comment on the Tasmanians. Uh, they can comment on that themselves. But uh, certainly each of the states uh, is cognizant of the difficulties that you're all facing. They're all putting in various uh, schemes. They're cooperating and sharing information amongst uh, amongst the states, but also with us as the, at the federal level, uh, as is uh, as is Queensland. And and the last question here regarding uh, PMC's consultations. Uh, I'll let PMC comment about uh, about that. I don't think they're online today, but we'll pass that message on. Um, that, of course, uh, we do need more truck drivers, we need more licences, we need more people uh, available. And, uh, uh, you, you know, obviously, it's it, whilst it's difficult to get low-paid, uh, you know, cleaners and things like that, the 4,000 extra that they're looking for at Sydney Airport, just as an example, uh, you know, we have the same difficulties recruiting forklift drivers and truck drivers as well. So um, um, uh, it's a real... It's a real oh, so as, as some of you know, I ran Toll globally, I ran Linfox globally and was on the board of Australia Post. Um, it's, a, it's a Western world phenomena. It's a Western world phenomena, which is incredibly interesting for me anyway. Um, do, do, when, when you're thinking about do you want your son and daughter, do you want them to be a truck driver? Yes or no? Do you want them to be a diesel mechanic? Now... I know truck drivers earning two hundred thousand dollars a year. I've got, I'm on a board at the moment where diesel mechanic in the Pilbara's on two hundred fifty-two thousand dollars a year for a thirty-eight hour week, fly in, fly out. But in the Western world, we've changed our thinking about we what we aspire our children to do. We don't want them typically to go to tech colleges. We want them to finish their HSC. We want them to, to get a degree. We don't value some of these jobs as much as they would. I would say to you that there's nearly no more highly skilled job than a truck driver. Doesn't matter how many degrees you've got. If you're punching 64 tonne B double or 120 tonne road train down the road at 100 kilometres an hour and you can't basically take your mind off anything for five hours, 
and you can't move maybe a metre either side of the line, you are highly skilled. Mm. When you do a 1,000 kilometres a day every day, you are highly skilled, highly trained and highly competent. But we don't, in the Western world, because it's the same problems in Europe, it's the same problems in the US, no one's going into truck driving, we don't value these jobs enough. Uh, and we don't because as we've risen through the ex-social economic group ourselves, my mother made me drive a truck when I was 12, highly illegal. <laughs> but we don't, we wouldn't do that to our kids today. Mm. It's a really interesting discussion about how we think about employment and who is valuable. Mm. But that's mm. another, another hour in itself. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, we're, we're well into, uh, into our time. I do want to thank you. Uh, Michael, we, we have a, a small team in the export supply chain <coughs> services, uh, in, uh, within, uh, within Austrade. I acknowledge the terrific work that they've done to pull all this together and uh, the, the in incredible logistics just to gather all the information that we get to produce the snapshot. It's a valuable piece of information, highly regarded by the government and, and, uh, and highly regarded by both industry and, and, and exporters, uh, industry associations and exporters as well. Uh, we thank you all for your attendance today and uh, uh, stay close to us. We are doing the best we can to get the best information to you as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, uh, watch this space because uh, we'll be continuing to do this kind of virtual uh, uh, um, um, exchange with you on a periodic basis. So thank you very much for your attendance today. Have a great day. Bye for now.